Only in that relationship with our Heavenly Father do we find everything that satisfies us, and so He is our great priority. Welcome to Corinth Baptist Church Sunday Worship Services with Pastor Teacher Joey Carroll. When pastors fall into sin, they gouge out the road of the gospel. If you're born again, and yet you are unrepentant in sin, and unwilling to deal with sin in your life, you're gouging out the road to advance the gospel. If you have your Bibles this morning, please be turning to Matthew chapter 26, verse 6. Now, it'll be a while before I get there, but at least you're there when we do get there. Now, we've been in Hebrews for quite some time, and we've been talking in reference to this day that we call today. And last week, we started the process of discussing how in the world did we get to today? What did God do yesterday that made today so special? And we walked from the confession all the way to the fig tree, and we didn't get to the fig tree until Sunday night. And my intention was this morning to walk from an anointing to glory, and then I got up this morning, I didn't have any peace about it, and so we flipped it around and I spent much time in prayer. And so we're going to walk backwards through this thing, and I believe there's great purpose in that, but we're going to walk backwards from glory to perfume. And you're already parked at perfume, so when we get there, you're already there, but I will carry you there, okay? Now, the greatest challenge this morning is within you. It's your own heart. Hebrews 3 says four times, the writer of Hebrews, do not harden your heart. The only reason that God will not do a work in your heart this morning, as if He hasn't already, is because you sit there with a hard heart, and I can't do anything about it. You're the only person that can. So let me encourage you, as we walk through the Word of God, to soften your heart. Allow the Spirit of God to stir humility in your heart. This is a risen God speaking to us from His Word. Let's receive it with all humility. Now, I want to do two things. I want to exalt a risen Savior, certainly, but I also want to exhort a church by the sacrifice of a sinner. I'm going to speak of the sacrifice of a sinner, not just a sacrifice of the Savior this morning. So it's so precious to our Lord. But first, let's start with glory. Where is Jesus now? After the resurrection, where is He? And Philippians 2 tells us this. The Bible says, For this reason, meaning His suffering and His death, God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name which is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess Christ Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And all the church said, Amen. That's where our Savior is seated this morning at the right hand of the Father. But before there was a crown and before there was a name greater than any other name, there was a resurrection. And this resurrection was the greatest display of the mighty power of God that has ever been displayed. It's even greater than creation itself. Jesus became a man. Don't ever think He became anything else than a man. He was just like us. And God, according to Ephesians 1, used His might to raise a dead man back to life. And the reason that that's so glorious to us is because it means that one day we as men and women in the weakness of our flesh by the power, the same power that God displayed in raising His Son, that same power will raise us up one day who are in Christ and we will forever be in the presence of God's glory. Now, I love the way Luke puts the resurrection. He does it like nobody else. Two women approached the tomb, Mary and Mary, and the angel or the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. You do understand that no other God, no other deity... There's no one else on the planet that anyone worships that makes that statement right there. Why do you seek for the living among the dead? Everyone else has to turn that around 
and say, you have to seek the dead because our God is dead. I don't care who their God is. He's dead. We're celebrating Easter this morning because our God has been raised up from the dead. He was not there. His tomb is empty. But you realize huh, that this whole process that we've been talking about in the book of Hebrews, this is what took place yesterday to make today so special that we've been in this time period that Scripture refers to as today since that morning sun came up one Sunday morning. Two women walked to a tomb and the Bible says, I love it, just as the sun broke the sky. And when that sun broke the sky, that Savior walked out of a tomb and we went from yesterday to today. And we will be in today by the grace of God until the Lord Jesus Christ breaks through that sky again. Don't you dare sit there in the hardness of your heart and reject the grace of God because He still allowed it to be today. And you still can come to this Savior, this great resurrection. And this is the passage that I was referring to just a few moments ago in 1 Corinthians 15. And we talked about this last year. Look at this. Now Christ has been raised from the dead. And look at this word, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Now, Chances are, being from the South, in about a month, you're going to plant a garden. And for some of you, it'll be the last of May, and you'll be bragging about it. But for the rest of us, it'll be June that we'll walk out to the garden. And all those tomato plants, while we plant dozens of those plants, I'll never know. We only need two or three. But there's dozens in a long row, and there's all these green little balls. And amidst all that green, there's going to be one red tomato. And you're going to go out there, and you're going to pick that tomato. And you'll probably eat it before you get back to the house. But if you don't, what will you do as soon as you get in the house? You'll say, look what we've got. What does that mean? What does that mean that's coming tomorrow? A whole lot more red tomatoes for us to enjoy. Do you realize when Jesus walked out of the tomb, he was the first ripe tomato? And when we look at that resurrection, we can walk back in the house and rejoice and say, look what I have found. The first fruits of what is to come. And one day, God will pick us as well because we too will be ripe and He will raise us from the dead and carry us into His house as His children. This resurrection that we celebrate is, if we don't have this, go home. What you're doing now is meaningless and my words are worthless. There's nothing to this Christianity. It has become like every other religion in the world. It is pointless and it cannot save. But because of the resurrection, because of the first fruits, it can save. And it can raise from the dead. This is everything to us. Look at what he says in verse 21. For at... For since by a man came death, meaning Adam, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and after that, those who belong to Christ at his coming. Our resurrection is tied to his resurrection. And Paul says in Corinth, If Jesus was raised from the dead, then you'll be raised from the dead. And then he turns it around. He says, if you're not going to be raised from the dead, then Jesus was never raised from the dead. But praise God, we've got an empty tomb that says he was. And so we trust that we will too. But before there was a resurrection, what did there have to be? There had to be a grave. Isaiah 53 puts it this way. His grave was assigned with wicked men. The King of kings and the Lord of lords died among two thieves. And he laid in death for three days. Yet, because of Joseph of Arimathea coming to claim his body, he was with a rich man in his death. He had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. It's hard to believe that Jesus did this. Think about this. When he was God, he could not die. But in order for him 
or when he became a man, the purpose of him becoming a man was in order that he might die. So God, who created us, became a man so he could die like a man, and he stayed in his grave for three days. Now, it gets worse from here, because in order for him to be a grave, in a grave, there had to be a crucifixion. I love the way John puts this. He simply says it in four words. Let me read it to you. John 19. They took Jesus, therefore, and He went out bearing His own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is in Hebrew pronounced Golgotha. And here He says it. There they crucified Him. And with Him two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. No emotions. No drama to prick your heart. He simply says, they crucified Him. That God who became a man hung on a cross that He held together by His own authority and died among thieves. Now, in order for Him to be crucified, or before that crucifixion, there was much suffering, much torture, Isaiah 52, I think Rob wanted to back it up and read this part this morning. Look at what it says. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. I love what the ESV says. As many as were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance. You know what that means? Mel Gibson got it wrong. If you've ever seen the passion of the Christ with all the blood and all the gore, he fell short. Scripture says that they beat him so that when you looked upon him, you had to ask the question, is that a man? It's remarkable to think what the Creator allowed himself to go through in order that you might sit here this morning, hear the gospel and have an opportunity to respond to that gospel by faith. It's amazing what our Savior went through in order for us to sit here this morning and lift our hands and our voices in praise. He was beaten beyond the recognition of a man. But, I won't leave you there. Because while He was shedding His blood and dying, and being beaten to death, there was something marvelous going on in heaven. You see, we saw horror, but in heaven they saw glory. And the writer of Hebrews carries us to the other side so that we can see the beauty of the blood as it flowed. Look at Hebrews 9. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, He entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that was not made with hands. That is to say, not of this creation and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through His own blood, He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now let me explain that to you just a second. In the Old Testament... God chose one particular group of people, the Israelites. And He said, you're going to be my possession. And He brought them to Himself to worship Him and walk with Him. And this is what He said to them. I want you to build a tabernacle. In that tabernacle was a very special room called the Holy of Holies. In that room resided the Spirit of God. Now, one time a year one man was allowed to go into that Holy of Holies. But when he came into the presence of God, he had to bring blood. He had to bring sacrifices in order to pay for his own sins and then the sins of his people. But the problem with that was, that was only a picture. That sanctuary didn't really mean anything. It was a picture of the sanctuary that was in heaven. And those were sacrifices that were pictures of the real sacrifice to come. When Jesus came, it was not a picture of anything. It was the fulfillment 
of the Almighty God. And so when he walked, look back at the passage, when he walked back in verse 11, he walked into a more perfect tabernacle that was not made with hands. Some of y'all are old enough to remember a hymn that we used to sing called Not Made With Hands. And that's exactly what it's referring to. There's a temple or a tabernacle in heaven that was not made with hands. And the Holy of Holies is real and in it resides the presence of God. Now that man could only go in one time a year. And that without, not without taking blood. But Christ walked in and sat down and obtained our eternal redemption. Now this is a beautiful word. You know what eternal means. But this word redemption is pronounced lutrosis. It means ransom. You see, you had to have someone to pay your ransom note. You're guilty. I'm guilty. We're all guilty of our sin and we're held in bondage and we can't get out unless someone comes and pays our ransom for us. Christ walked into the Holy of Holies, not by the blood of goats and bulls. While the blood was flowing down on the cross, He walked into the real Holy of Holies, into the presence of His Father and paid our ransom. While we watched in horror and disgust, God was satisfied with the sacrifice. Ransom was paid. Look what happened. Look at verse 13. The blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh. In the Old Testament, those sacrifices, they cleanse the outside. But nobody could go into the Holy of Holies. You still can't get into the presence of God because what's wrong? There's something dirtier than the outside. What is it? What is it? It's the inside. It's the inside that separates us from God. Look at verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God cleanse your conscience, which is the inside? from dead works to serve the living God. A bull's blood might can clean up what's on the outside, but you're going to need the sacrifice of a Savior to cleanse your heart. If you ever want to come into the presence of God as a child of God and worship God, you'll need the blood of His Son. It's what cleanses you whole. Now, there's so much more that happens I just want to point to three things. Here's the second one in Hebrews 9. Look at this. It was necessary for the copies of the things in heaven to be cleansed with the animals. But the heavenly things themselves needed better sacrifices than these. For Christ didn't enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one. But He went into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for who? For you, for me, for us. And look what he did. Nor was it that he would offer himself as often as the high priest enters the holy place. Remember, year after year after year on that one day with blood that was not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to do what? Put away our sin. You know how marvelous that is? I don't know. I hope you have, but I don't know if you've grown to the place in your spiritual life where you hate your sin. Now, if you're in Christ, you're growing toward that way. It needs to be that way. But it's a beautiful thought when we, when we do things we shouldn't do, when we say things we shouldn't say, when we have feelings and attitudes toward other people that we shouldn't have, and you despise those things in your heart, and you get so angry at yourself, you need to know there's, there's coming a day because of the sacrifice of Christ. Not only has He paid your ransom note, but He has taken your sin and He has put it behind His back. It is no more. And so because of His sacrifice, when you stand before the Father, it's going to be, this is ridiculous, it's going to be as though you've never sinned. 
Because when He looks upon you, He will see the righteousness of His Son. You don't think there's going to be some worship going on when you fall before the Father and you know who you were, but now you realize who He has made you to be? Holy and blameless in His sight? You'll never want to see again what He put behind His back. It's the old you. You'll never want to remember it. You'll only want to remember what new creature He has made you in Christ Jesus. He has paid your ransom. And He has put away your sin. And last thing, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which could never take away sin. But He, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all times, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until His enemies be made a footstool for His feet. For by one offering, He has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. I paid your ransom note. I put away your sin. And now I've made you perfect. We saw horror. God said, my sons and daughters have been made perfect. Now, what can we do? I can walk right into the Holy of Holies and I can bow down in the presence of God myself and lift my hearts and my arms in praise to a God who has made me worthy now to be in His presence. That horror was beautiful. That cross was perfect and amazing. And it has accomplished everything for us. But we got to go back. Because for there to be a cross, there had to be a rejection. Look at Matthew 27. The governor said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas, who was a violent thief. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? And they all said, crucify him. And he said, what evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more saying, crucify him, crucify him. Now, please don't think that you would have said anything but that. Audrey went to a concert the other night and she was telling me, you know, it's amazing how easy it is to get several thousand people to do the same thing. She said they got everybody to, what was it, turn on their light on their cell phone and hold up their lights at the concert so it looked like a bunch of stars. She said, just so easy. He just guided thousands of people just like that. Those times are fun, but you know when it's not fun? When it's the world that holds sway over your life and so easily it influences you to live a life of sin. Are you easy? Does the world and the devil have his way just swaying you however he wants you to go? We would have been in this crowd. And you know what's the most disheartening? Everybody that was shouting had been made in his image. He created them in his own image and placed them in a perfect garden and pursued them with a relationship I wonder how he felt when all those that he had showered all of his love on in creation turned their back against him and shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But before there was a crowd that disowned him, there was a worm-hearted leader who sought to only please the people. This passage is one of the most frustrating passages that you'll find in Scripture. Pilate's the one that handed him over. He was the political leader of the day. And look what the passage says in Matthew 27, 18. He knew that because of envy, they had handed him over. You have to be a spineless worm to know the truth and ignore it in order that you might obtain power and prestige. So he did exactly what the crowd commanded him to do, even though he knew that this was an innocent man. But Pilate wasn't the only man. 
There was the closest. There was Peter. Matthew 26 says, Then Peter began to curse and swear, I do not know the man. Never mind that I've spent three years walking side by side with him. Never mind that he called me into service of the king. Never mind that just a few hours later I said, Lord, even if I have to die, I'll never deny you. And yet three times, what did he do? I swear, I don't know him. I don't know the man. But before there was one, there was twelve standing in the garden. This had to take place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Standing in the garden when the soldiers came, all those bold eleven. I'm not leaving. Ran. Ran for their lives. But even before this, our Lord went through something that was extremely difficult. Luke puts it like nobody else. Being in agony, he was praying fervently and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. This Passion Week was so difficult. Our Lord walked into the Garden of Gethsemane to spend his last moments before his arrest praying to his Father. Now, you need to understand, he was resolved to the will of God. Each time he concluded his prayer with, but not my will be done, right? Yours. And yet he sought the Father if there's any other way. Now let me tell you, I do not believe, and we don't have Scripture, but I do not believe it was because of the fear of death. I fully believe it was because of the wrath of God that he was about to face, that you and I will never know. We will never know if we are in Christ what Jesus faced when he died and suffered the full wrath of God to pay our price. That being the case, I would go to the Father often and say, if we can do this another way. Before that, there was one of the twelve who sold him out. Matthew 26. Then one of the twelve named Judas went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out thirty pieces of silver. Small price for a God of infinite worth. You see, this was a difficult week. This is what we call the Passion Week, and everything that we walked through happened in one week. One sold him out. He went to a garden and prayed until he bled. Eleven men that had walked with him for three years ran. His closest one, Peter, stood up and denied him. They had a mock trial where man after man lied to try to find some sort of verdict where he could be guilty enough to deserve death. They handed him over to a man named Pilate who knew the truth and walked away. His own creation then began to shout, crucify him. How would you all like me to lead you all in that this morning? Anybody be comfortable shouting that? Crucify him, crucify him. They beat him beyond the recognition of a man they nailed him to a cross and they put God in a tomb and he died. And three days later, he rose into glory. What a week. What a glorious week. Last thing, and then we're finished. Just before the week began, there's something that happened in Matthew 26, 6 that was so Precious to our Lord. I want to read it to you. Matthew 26, 6 says, Now, when Jesus was in Bethany, at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume. She poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. But the disciples, we find out from John it was Judas, were angry when they saw this and said, Why the waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. Verse 10, But 
Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you don't always have me. For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, and this is why I put it in here this morning, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done also will be spoken of memory, in memory of her. You know what Mary does here? And by the way, she did this on a Saturday, best you can tell from Scripture. And so this following Saturday, he was in the tomb. So just a week from the tomb, Mary takes a very expensive jar of perfume, breaks it. John says she poured it on his feet, wiped his feet with her hair, and then poured it on his head. You know what this forever stands for us? What it means to be a Christian. You want to know how a Christian should act and how a Christian should live? Like Mary. She so loved her Lord that in comparison she despised herself. She was willing to make a fool of herself to her Lord to display her love and lay on the ground at His feet and take her long flowing hair and lay it over His muddy feet and wash His feet. While everybody else looked on in disgust, Mary said, I love Him so much, I'll do anything for Him. I'll be willing to make a fool for Him. This is my Savior and my Lord. I'll be glad to give of myself. But she didn't just give of herself, right? She gave of everything she had. We find out from other places that that perfume probably cost about a year's salary. She broke it. Bam. Poured it all out. Not only did she give of herself, she gave everything she had because she loved this one who was going to ransom her, who was going to hide her sin, and who was going to make her perfect. Church, he's worth every bit of that and more. Give your life. Give all that you have. He has done that for you. And he's offering you eternal redemption. He's offering you A place in the Holy of Holies to walk in the presence of God Almighty where you could never go before and fall on your knees and worship Him. That's what He offers you. Today, if you hear His voice, don't you dare harden your heart.